Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Welcome to another episode of The Braden Anderson Show. I have a very special guest with me today, David Cheney Sr. He's a member of the 100 Black Men, VP of Programming. Right. Does a lot of really important things in the city of Philadelphia for black men and women um, and teenagers, children coming up. Yeah. Um, talk to us just a little bit about what you do. Give us a little bit of background on yourself. Let me give a little bit of background, like you said, on myself. Uh, my name is David Cheney Sr. Um, I'm a member of the 100 Black Men chapter here in Philadelphia, which is a national chapter throughout America, which is the national 100 Black Men of America. Uh, I'm the VP of programming. VP of programming meaning I'm handling all the programmings that fall under the 100 uh, logo from uh, dollars and cents, um, the historical um, um we have a um, historical um, black history contest that is under the black and mentorship. So we do a lot in the community. Right now we, are, we have eight high schools, I mean eight schools that we work with throughout the city of Philadelphia. Uh, our main school is Vault Bay Pitcher High School, which uh, I am an administrator over there along with um, Real World Learning. And also I'm the head coach, track coach for the high school. That's awesome. A lot of opportunities to a lot of opportunities to mold young men and women, um, and and make a difference. Make a whole lot, lot of difference, especially here in the city of Philadelphia. Um, you know, because of the crime rate and the poverty that been going on in Philadelphia, we are maybe the sixth largest city in the country, and things haven't been going well, but. They don't sow the good things that have been going on in Philly. We have a lot of good things going on in Philly, and we have a lot of good organizations that is working together to bring a lot of things to our, for our future for Philadelphia and people who live in Philly and who are coming to Philly. That's exciting, man. So I want to get right into kind of what the issues are right now at, at play. And I want to start with kind of a pivotal time, okay. thinking about the year 2020. Mm-hmm. George Floyd, you know, Black Lives Matter. Right. Right. Uh, and I can share with you kind of s some observations that I had and kind of some things that I felt that led to me writing Black Resilience and starting the Black Resilience Movement. Okay. Um, but it was essentially for me a lot of the consumption of narratives of Black pain and narratives of Black victimhood mm -hmm. that really started to eat away at me. Right. Right. I was watching videos just like you were and the whole country was of black men and women being murdered on repeat. Right. It, it felt like it was on repeat. Right. Every single time you turn the news on, every single time you're scrolling on on your phone. Right. And I thought about kind of what that was doing to me. Right. And it was really it was breaking my spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. It was making me feel discouraged. Right. Even as some, somebody who was having a lot of success in life, it starts to make you feel like a victim. It starts to make you feel like I'm losing even when you're winning. Right. Right. And I started to think about what kind of impact that from a mental health perspective that that would have on younger generations coming up, growing up, seeing this as the solution. Right. Mm -hmm. the, this awareness campaign. And all the depictions of blackness that dominate mainstream media really surround narratives of pain. And you're right. Uh, let's take it a step back, even before the George Floyd incident. Um, let's take it a step back to the 60s. Even, you know, I was born in the 60s. When you saw dogs being turned on people of color, 
for no reason because they wanted the right to vote. They wanted equal rights. So when you take it back then, and even let's take it farther back, even when our ancestors came over, it, it always entreated me. No one talked about the mental health piece in that because what that does to a person when they see things like that happen to people that look like them and probably could be them. And not, not even saying probably, could be them. So it, it's the piece that what are we showing our next generation? Because they see that. I always go back to what my grandparents used to tell me. What you send out your front door is what you get back in your front door. Meaning, if you send hatred and despair, anything out your front door, that's what you're going to get back in your front door. And I think we have done that, not as our people, but as a whole, as the world, we have sunk hatred, uh, disagreement, everything that done happened, and we show it. Now we see our kids doing it. Now we see, you know, other people doing it to other people. And what is the solution? What is the solution? And right. a lot of times when you talk about the mental health piece, that does do something to the mind. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I remember this rap song. I don't know y'all remember. Uh, your mind's played tricks on you. Yeah. And, and that does. The mind really does. Because wherever it happens up here and you see it, you'd be like, wow, that's really going on. Absolutely. And, and I think, too, it's, it's almost a trap, right, that you can fall into. Mm -hmm. Because it is, it's appealing because it's true. Right. The black community has been victimized relentlessly mm -hmm. and so it is very convenient to talk about that and to focus only on that right. right and it's not that that does not deserve attention right we need to be aware of that we've had a 20 30 year awareness campaign mm -hmm. right the, the the solution that's been propped up has been a campaign to guilt trip the white community into feeling bad for black people because of our suffering mm -hmm. and do something about it as a result of that guilt right right that white guilt you are privileged you haven't been through these things whether you have personally persecuted black people or not mm -hmm. they're being persecuted and they're being persecuted by people who look like you therefore you're responsible and the problem with that is literally half of the population that just doesn't work Right. Half it, of the population. It, it don't work. It's not even that it doesn't work. It makes them even more angry. It makes them, it, it seeds even more conflict and, and, and fight there in terms of the polarization that's happened in this country. But that's just the flip side. So there's, it's not working with half the country, which is too many. 50% <laughs> is too many. I get it, right, that there's always going to be a percentage that it doesn't work with, but 50% is too many. Right. Right? And then when you look at the other side, that with a large majority of the black population, Pew Research Poll came out, 70% of black Americans don't believe that the increased attention on racism, Black Lives Matter movement, did anything to meaningfully change their life for the better. Right. And so if 70 percent of black people are feeling that way and we know that there's a significant piece of the population that's being discouraged by that awareness movement, is that not actually an effective tactic from a racist perspective? Would that not be a good motive if you actually had the opposite in mind? Right. If you actually wanted to decrease the percentages of, of black Americans finding success and believing in themselves that they can be successful, that they can make it, right? When you're constantly flooding the, the market and flooding the social channels with narratives of despair, right? Like, what does that do? And I guess the, the question becomes, what are some other alternatives, right? Because some people may be listening to this, watching this and thinking, well, companies are trying to do the right thing. A lot of white people are trying to do the right thing. A lot of organizations are trying to do the right thing. Right. Black Lives Matter, the organization, and many associated with the movement are trying to do the right thing, mm -hmm. I think. For many people, heart's in the right place, certainly. 
But what are some ways that, you know, are kind of alternatives to focusing on those pain narratives as kind of a next step and, and not necessarily pointing that out as that was a failure, that's something that we regret, but thinking about what are we going to do tomorrow? What are we going to do in the future? I think knowing your purpose in life, it comes down to that, knowing your purpose, knowing why, knowing the why, why you're here. What is your purpose? Your purpose is to be great. That should be your main purpose. I don't care if you come from um, low income, middle income, high income. Your purpose is to be great. Don't mean you have to stay in them positions always. Your purpose is to be great, and we do not teach that. And that's something as a whole we need to teach that. We need to teach you can be great. You can be the next president. You can be a CEO of your own company. You can start some programs. You can work together with other ethnic groups and make and change the world. We need to get back to that. We was doing that at one time. Something happened. <laughs> Something went wrong. What do you think discourages, based on your work, right, coaching track and field, working with young men and women, trying to sponsor, mentor the next generation and add value to them, what do you think is, is the biggest thing that's, that's, that's a, that what's, what's causing that mental block? Trust. Mm. Trust. Um, I think a lot of times we have lost trust, not only in the system, but in each other. <laughs> the trust issue. Because I hear it a lot of times from young people, oh, you just showing up, but are you going to be here for the long run? That's the piece. A lot of us come from homes that we don't come from two-parent homes. Or we've been raised by other family members. So it's a trust issue. It's an abandonment issue. Is you going to be there for the long run? That's one of the things I love about being a member of this organization, the 100. You're a mentor for a lifetime. You're going to mentor someone. You're going to mentor the young people that come across your program for a lifetime. Mm. And then they're going to become mentors. So... It's a trust issue, and I think that's the biggest thing that is going on with the world and been going on. It's the trust issue. The trust in if you say you're going to be there, be there. Mm -hmm. Just don't say it one time and keep it going. And I think that's a, that's been the issue going on. Um, Do you, you know, think that that's one of the issues with, with the protests, that they happen for a couple of weeks, they happen for a couple of months? Right. And, then, and then everything just... And then, wait a second. What what, what Calm happened? Down. Right. Everybody right. was like, okay, we, you know, companies. Everybody put money out there, and they came up with these programs. Then everything that stopped. I think people still need to have the compensation around what happened to um, my dear brother George, mm. uh, Bianca Taylor. They need to have still have this conversation mm -hmm. at the dinner table with their kids because this is something is real. Um, so you're talking about the black community needs to have the conversation, right? I think everybody, yeah, everybody need to have the conversation. Yeah, we all need to sit down at the table. We need to discuss. We need to have a conversation on what went wrong, what was promised, and it never happened. Mm. In, you, I, I always say, you know. It depends on how we educate each other. And a lot of times, when we think we're doing something right, it always happens when a backfire comes in, mm -hmm. and that will happen. We need to educate and really get to the, the core of what's going on in the world today. What behind everything? And we know what's behind the whole, you know, why people don't want to get along. But we need to get down to what's the real reason. Yeah. I get mean, down to I, the true facts. Yeah. And I, how we can overcome. Because I'm like this you ain't got to like me. You got to love me because you're supposed to love your enemies. You got to love me. You ain't got to like me. You like food, <laughs> mm -hmm. you like going on vacations. But when it comes down to um, we all are human, are we going to agree on everything? No, we're not. 
if we did, the world would be in total chaos. <laughs> yeah. Worse than it is now. I think that's that's been a huge problem, right? right. When you look at just the the political backdrop mm -hmm. right now, um, where we are just in terms of political relations. Right. I talked about the polarization of this country earlier, and it's a big problem. It's a big problem when a different system of political beliefs, mm -hmm. right, a different political party being a member of that party or being a moderate, mm -hmm. right, makes you a villain automatically. And and people right, right now on both sides, people shut down. They shut down. I, I'm Democrat, you're Republican. I'm Republican, you're Democrat. Mm -hmm. Nothing we can talk about. I disagree fundamentally with your belief system. I don't believe there's anything val valid that you have to say, and I'm shutting down, right? And that's not a that's not something that's gonna work. It's we, not when it's we're not. not just a we're one nation, right? But we are one race. We're a part of the human the race. Race, and you mentioned that, and I think part of the issue is and part of what's daunting and discouraging for everybody black white asian hispanic is that the solution to try to solve that issue that we just discussed i mean that's the big that's the big kahuna that's mm -hmm. what we really need to solve right we need to stop having to have that race conversation but the issue is we of course still have to have the conversation because it's a big problem Right. I would have loved to not have to write a book on black resilience to try to continue to make efforts to solve this issue. Mm -hmm. But it's still a major issue. And I wanted to come at this from a different perspective, right. from the perspective of, listen, I want to change the world. And I know that we're all trying to change the world and we're all going to do our little piece to get there. Mm -hmm. But that's really, really hard to tell a kid. That's Most really, definitely. really hard to tell somebody who's in school right now and has dreams and is trying to figure out how to navigate this world. And they're seeing videos and media coming in depicting just black trauma everywhere, unfairness, inequality, privilege, lack of privilege, difficulties in terms of socioeconomic status, generational issues. And it's really difficult to tell that person, yeah, look, look, we're going to change the world. Right. Because people have been looking at their watch saying, didn't you say that 10 years ago? Didn't you say that five years ago? Uh, 20 years ago. I, I can't wait any long. This is my life. Right. And so I wrote Black Resilience predicated on one fundamental promise. Right. right? The promise that, listen, I, I hope the world changes, but I promise you, I'm not going to bet my life on that. Right. We need to have a huddle. I need to have a huddle, an internal discussion with myself to figure out how I'm going to respond to my surroundings, to my environment, right? And that, I think, can be a really big difference maker for people who are dealing with trust issues. You mentioned trust, trust mm -hmm. in the system, trust in, in the, their superiors, trust in the adults around them, mm -hmm. right? Their teachers, their educators, that they're really going to be there for them, that they're going to kind of help them get where they need to go, but also trusting that if they work as hard as they possibly can. I think this is the biggest thing, John, is is a lot of folks feel like even if I worked as hard as I possibly could, something's going to stop me. They're going to stop me. This the society yeah. is not fair. Society, society will um portray that to you um always been told you know you're only gonna go higher than they let you go and that's not true you're only gonna go higher as you go and my thing is you don't let nobody control you if you want to go up the ladder you go up the ladder you keep going up that ladder till you finish and your journey be done but on that journey you bring other people with you because right, right. you don't have the gift to just to keep it to yourself. You have the gift to share it. And I know a coworker of mine, me and her was having a conversation um, a month ago, and she said, you know what your biggest gift is? And I'm like, 
No, tell me. She said, you're a connector, mm. meaning you connect people. Yeah. That's what you do best. You connect people. Yeah. You're not worrying about titles or anything like that. You are a connector, and that's your main goal, your main purpose, to connect people. You're not worrying if they like you, they don't like you, or they looking at the same purpose, the same drive you are looking at. You willing to sit back and say, okay, I know a program, I know somebody you need to talk to. You want to connect people. And that's that's the main thing I like doing, connecting and mentoring. Anything else, it's second nature. Um, and I can speak to that just from you know the amount of time I've known you. Right. You, you absolutely are a connector. <laughs> and I think we all, and I say we, I mean anybody listening, right. you got to figure out, because a lot of people ask me, like, well, what does making it mean, right? Because they look at the way that I have interpreted that for myself, right? And they may not feel the same way in terms of how they define making it and, or how they define being successful. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, for me, I wanted to work for one of the largest law firms in the world. I wanted to start businesses. I wanted to invest and own assets. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. And there's a lot of different arguments I might make for why that's the best thing for others to do based on my personal experience. But at the end of the day, you got to look in the mirror and figure out who are you? Who do you want to be? Because bias is just somebody else not seeing that. Right. And you hit it right on the head, looking in the mirror at yourself. I remember saying that one time and I had a couple of brothers look at me and got real upset because they were like, oh, oh, who are you pointing? You know, no, let's look in the mirror at each other. Meaning I have to look in the mirror every day, look at some of the things I might have done wrong, but I'm looking in the mirror. How can I correct this? You know, take ownership. A lot of times we don't want to take ownership. We get that ego or that chip on our shoulder, like it's all about us. It's not all about, no. It's about what you provide for the world, for the community, for your family. That's what it's about. At the end of the day, when you know everything is done, you can go home and feel most gracefully happy for yourself. But when you start thinking, oh, it's about me, and don't want to accept reality by taking that look in the mirror, something's wrong there. Something's and, wrong. And being able to kind of figure out where I am today right, and who I want to be tomorrow and understand that that's really the same person, right? And that everything that you do every single day is moving you further or closer to that goal of realizing that identity for yourself and understanding that bias and racism, both inter interactional racism and mm -hmm. systemic racism are a rejection of your identity as it is felt understood by you. But if you don't have personally a strong sense of your own identity, it will be very, very difficult for you to transcend the system and fabric of racism, right? And so I think one piece, and you know, a question for you is, you know, how, how have you been able to help the folks that you've mentored figure out what it is that they really want to do and who they want to be. I always ask this question to a lot of young people that I have mentored over my going on maybe 40 years, maybe more than that. I lost count. Um, I always ask them, what do you want to be? What is your drive? What is your purpose? If you want to be that basketball player, how are you going to work on it? And then I always tell them, always have a backup plan. Always have a backup plan. And I'm tell, I tell them my story. Um, went to college, uh, graduated from uh, Benjamin Franklin High School here in Philadelphia. Went on to one of the best uh, HBCUs, uh, St. Augustine College, which is now St. Augustine University. Right. And went there for academics and track, but also went there to become a civil engineer. Got my my second semester, which is my freshman year, I was like, uh, I don't think it's going to cut out to be a civil engineer. 
then think about, okay, what was going to be my backup? So I started thinking, I said, you know what? I like business. Got into business administration, didn't like it. Changed my major to accounting, didn't like that. Finally changed my major to something I liked because I did research, economics. Mm. Economics deal with the whole total package. So I was like, wow. So I can learn about accounting, business, all in one package. I'm going to stick with economics. Big picture. Big picture. I yeah. looked at the big picture. So when I got my economics degree, worked in corporate for a while, but something else pulled me to the side and like, no, they, that is where I want you at. I want you somewhere else. I want you coming back and giving back to the young people. Mm -hmm. That's your niche. That's your purpose. So I find myself, you know, after um, getting married to someone we met in college, uh, we had two lovely kids together. So I wound up living in North Carolina for a short term and helped out there, you know, mentoring, worked for the Boys and Girls Club, um, director for Parks and Rec, and really, you know, built a foundation. And a lot of them young people that was came through my path and journey became mayors of a town, went on to become, you know, social workers, um, uh, bankers, and police officers. Even when I came back to Philly, a lot of young people became, you know, different avenues, but they became successful. And I was like, wow, I really found my niche. That's incredible. And my niche wasn't going into corporate. Right. <laughs> I, I, I feel, realized, okay, it's not corporate, it's helping people. And like I said, two months ago, um, my coworker nailed it on the head. You're a connector. That's mm -hmm. what you do best. And I think what's the most important to me, uh, based on what you shared there, is that you don't necessarily have to have the correct path lined up right from the get-go. No, you don't. You can pick something, dive straight into it, though. Mm -hmm. You got to go head first. Head first. Jump straight in, two feet in, whatever analogy you want, you want to use. You have to go for it and go for it with everything that you have in order to explore whether it's right for you. Obviously, trying to do some research beforehand hopefully can help you not have to change because that you only time is precious. Very right? precious. But I think what's really cool about your story is that you felt empowered, right, and capable. You weren't afraid. You weren't afraid of, like, you didn't not go into civil engineering because you were afraid of failing. It was because you decided that's not who you were. That's not what you wanted to do, right? And you let your drive and the purpose-driven mentality take you on the path in, in life's journey for you. Mm -hmm. And I think so long as our community feels empowered to do that, we'll have a completely different country. country we'll have a completely different situation. And always surround yourself with people who can be your mentors. You know, I still have mentors today who I can call upon. Um, I tell people this because a lot of people get it. Oh, I don't need nobody. You know, I'm cool. I can do it by myself. Nah. <laughs> That's not reality. You know, we all right. cannot do it by ourselves. You surround yourself with people who are going to be that support. And you always surround yourself with people who don't care, men, women, who can be your mentors, who can mentor you throughout your life. Uh, I have had great mentors throughout my life. Um, I always tell people my uh, role models have been my grandparents. You know, my grandfather, he didn't have a, a high school or I think he dropped out even in the fifth or sixth grade. Really don't know, but but this guy became a barber. You know, he he was a, a sharecropper, and he he had things in line. Uh, even when he became blind, he still had things in line. My grandmother was, you know, a pillar of her community. So, and I, I watched that as you know, I stayed with him up until I was twelve. And then I 
came back to Philly, I watched that how they was, especially after my grandfather died, my grandmother was a very outspoken person in her community. You know, she helped other her other family members and her other neighbors' kids get to where they need to get and in their lifetime, even in their education. She always was like pushing education. So I'm like, wow, you know, this was a lady and also a guy who they didn't finish school. They had to quit school to go and work and take care of their other siblings, but they pushing education like but one of the things they always told me, they said, you learn education just by being around people. Right. I hear I hear a couple things there. One, how important it is to leverage what you have. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk about, well, I don't have this, and I don't have that, and I don't have this. We don't get to choose what we get. No. Right? Listen, growing up without privileges that other people have, it hurts. It, it does. hurts to see. I mean, I grew up seeing that, and it and it hurts. And it does. It's okay to take some time to be bitter about that, mm -hmm. right? Take some time. Really let that hit you. Let it hurt for but a minute. Don't let it be get you so hurt that you become. Um, I always say a nuisance mm. to the community, meaning right. you become it builds up hatred. That's where you start to resist yeah. everybody else being successful. Yeah. It gets toxic. Toxic. And that's why I tell people, no child, no one is born to hate or to kill. It's all That's, again, though, it goes back to leveraging what you have. Mm -hmm. So think about it like this. For me, I had a basketball. That's it. Right. Right. My biological dad, he left me when I was a baby. Mm -hmm. He left me a basketball. Mm -hmm. I, I went through a ridiculously terrible childhood. I was in and out of homelessness. I was getting abused at home. But I had this basketball. Mm -hmm. And I had the athleticism and height to play the game. I actually didn't love playing the game. I loved football. Mm -hmm. But basketball was the opportunity that I had to do something. And, mm -hmm. and that was my first path, right, mm -hmm. was I'm going to go to the NBA. I'm going to try to get a scholarship at least, play in college get some school paid for, and, you know, we'll see how far this basketball bounces. But that was what I had to leverage. I think one piece, too, when you think about bitterness, when you think about having that chip on your shoulder, being a little bit mad. I was mad. I was mad that I was homeless and getting beat up at home and dealing with racist teachers that weren't giving me a fair shake, mm -hmm. didn't see any value in me whatsoever, paid mm -hmm. no mind, to try and to teach and develop me as a young man. Mm -hmm. And that hurts because that you didn't create the circumstances that put you there. And so it's very easy to be angry. But again, it goes back to just how you can leverage a basketball. You can leverage that pain. You can leverage that heartbreak and that bitterness to become better. I leverage that just like I leverage anything else that I had. When you don't have much, you got to leverage what little you got. And that bitterness, that little chip on my shoulder, I, I started to think about things differently. You talk about that looking in the mirror. Mm -hmm. I looked in the mirror and I was like, man, you know what? How cool would it be if those teachers who think I'm stupid and don't think I'm worth teaching and think I'm just a future criminal, a future drug addict, whatever the heck that they think, mm -hmm. how cool would it be if I became, a, and I literally, I, I just, I put it out there mm -hmm. into the universe. I was like, how cool, I was just thinking at first, mm -hmm. how cool would it be if I became like a doctor or like a, a lawyer, right, working for the biggest law firm in the world, said this kind of stuff in right. New York City, right? I literally said this kind of stuff, and I was living in a town of 20,000, middle of nowhere in Canada, Absolutely never met a lawyer in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Certainly never I never seen a black lawyer, not even on TV. Right. It was impossible. But in my head, that bitterness, that chip on my shoulder, I was like, how cool would it be to make them fall off their chair, learn what I could become? Right? That idea, that mentality surrounding trying to prove somebody wrong, it doesn't always last as a motivator for a lifetime. 
but it might be able to get you through a year. It might be able to get you through the next checkpoint. It's one, it's one of your building blocks, and I have u- used that throughout my lifetime. It become one of your building blocks. Um, always tell people, one of my favorite cartoons always been Popeye. And every time he, you always say, oh, Blue Widow is knocking him out, that's beating up on him, all like that. But Pop, Popeye was this. He always went to that can of spinach. And when he got that spinach, it's like motivated him. And I always tell my haters, if you don't understand, you can hate me, talk about me all you want. You just, you like the spinach. You just give me more and mm. more strength to be where I need to be. Yeah. That mentality. It, it, it's like, you don't get it. I, yeah. I, I like, I'm like this. Y'all my biggest fans. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I would give you my autograph. Thank you. Because yeah. now you are taking me to my next level. I mean, because if this work hard, most definitely, I tell tell anybody, my best career is my being a father to my two kids, David Jr. and Deja. You know, they the best, you know, I can literally say God had blessed me with two wonderful kids, Deja, who is a senior at North Carolina Central, uh, David, who is now a assistant director at Jefferson Hospital. He used to be at the school district, but he left. But, you know. Congrats on a job well done, man. That's, that's incredible. I mean, you're talking to a young man who never met his father. Right. And I was a father to my two kids. And I always tell people this because one thing I sat back and I looked, basically the same thing you did. I remember sitting on my grand, grandparents' step in the back, on the back, and I was like this. I would, if I ever got married, had a family, this would not happen. Mm. To me, I would never leave my kids. I will always. Why did be that? Them. So let's talk about that because mm-hmm. I, I I talk about that in my book as well. Mm-hmm. Um, parenthood and in particular, let's talk about fatherhood, black okay. fatherhood, because there's there's a lot of there's some stigma surrounding black fathers. A whole lot of stigma. Um, you know, I I certainly didn't have the best experience with 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 my father. Um, you know, love the guy, have a decent relationship with him now, but it hurts to to not have them there, right? It, it really do hurts. Um, I, I, I goes back to, you know, I always use because I'm a firm believer in God, always will be and always been. Um, God don't put no more on you than you can bear. And I always say it's a, he knows what's best for you. My father, you know, can't can't not the guy. He was military, good, probably good person. Can't say probably good person, but some things he couldn't deal with, and he had to just say, you know what, I can't deal with that right now. I get that. That's fine. Um, but I think a lot of times society, society, makes black fathers look like they trash and they're not do you think that that harms because again we've talked about the lack of motivation so like there there is a lot of narrative surrounding just education Mm -hmm. in the black community education a a lot of too many folks in the black community will label focusing too much on education as as white Mm -hmm. as a trap as don't even you know it's not going to work out right you, you can't you can't succeed in the white world mm-hmm. looking at certain professions engineering for example economic certainly some business even that's white you can't succeed in that area fatherhood right there's narratives surrounding whether we can be successful as black men as fathers do you think that that is a not a self fulfilling prophecy but do you think that that narrative makes it harder for black men to step up? I think it makes it harder in several ways because as black men, we are great fathers by all means. Uh, don't care if you working, you know, low income, middle income, a high income, you got some great fathers out there. But I think where society has knocked us down they promote 
the bad side. Mm-hmm. They promote the bad picture. Yeah. And it works both ways because, you know, I love our black queens. They are the most beautiful um, women of the world. But I think a lot of time society comes in and make the split. Meaning, me and, me and Deborah, who is my ex-wife, uh, we, we understood we could not be good as husband and wife, but as parents, mm-hmm. we was great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we right. was great, and we still are great at it. I think society want to paint that picture if you don't have, if you and the wife is, or you are, the mate is somewhere else, y'all can't be that great parent. Mm-hmm. That's a lie. You can be that great parent. Right. I have friends who are great fathers and who is not with the significant others. So I know it can be done. But I think society has really broken that because they haven't shown us, you know, that that picture. Um, it's I about what you promote, right? You promote. If you're promoting and celebrating victimhood, right. you're going to get more of it. Mm-hmm. If you're celebrating and promoting excellent black fathers Mm -hmm. you're going to get Get more of it for a variety of different reasons one it's just representation right you're just seeing that happen and it's normalizing it Mm -hmm. and two you're able to identify particular examples of how that black man was able to circumvent obstacles rise above challenges to meet his obligation as a man Mm -hmm. to his kids because it's not easy. It's not. It's not easy. It's it's not. not. I had to fight and scratch and claw, right? When when you split (laughs) with your children's mom, Mm -hmm. it is not easy. And that's, I think, where a lot of men, not just black men, it is a big – it's difficult. And you have to – one, you have to make it the biggest priority in your life. You definitely got it. I always tell people like this. Being a father is the best career I think God ever gave me. It's the best career. One, you you can't get fired unless you fire yourself. <laughs> Two, you, you definitely ain't going to draw no unemployment if you do get fired. So <laughs> that's out of it. That's out totally out. But I think when you look at that career, that opportunity to be somebody, uh, father, you become their mentor. You become their provider. You become the person that they gonna see see themselves. You know when they I'm gonna be just like my dad, or you know, if you have a daughter, they can be like, that's the type of guy I would like to have mm-hmm. in my life mm-hmm. because you are that foundation. You are that foundation, and I think a lot of times, you know, we as men is broken mm-hmm. because. Yeah. We don't know our self worth, right? And that's been a stigma on us for years. And I think a lot of men don't understand how important. Like, there's a lot of guys who I've seen and talked to and tried mm-hmm. to counsel, where they just feel like it would be, they're just in the way. Like right. they're just, you know, that them trying to step up and and have that experience and take that responsibility that that's just making things harder or that you know that they're trying to let the new family move on or mm-hmm. they're just trying to tiptoe around and undervaluing their role and how important their, their presence role is. is in like, their role and that's one thing i always um i go back to always have good mentors around you because you need that good mentoring around you you need you need to get around and I always tell guys if you don't know how this your opportunity to go out there and connect with organization that talks about fatherhood uh, we have several in the city of Philadelphia I mean that's go out there and connect yourself and a lot of times I think brothers we get the the arrogance of nobody gonna tell me how to be a father mm-hmm Okay, I get that because really there's no textbook on how to be a parent or how to be a father. But you should be able to want the tools to work with because I used to say this and I still say it. I tell 
young people I have worked with, y'all are my best tools. And they'd be like, what are you talking about, Mr. Cheney? I said, guess what? I'm always it, learning. I'm learning from y'all how to be that great father to my two kids. <laughs> and they, they used to laugh about it. And they did. They laughed about it. Kids be like, even today, um, a lot of the guys be like, wow, Ms. Ch-. I said, no, you really helped me to raise my son. Is that how, because we talk about cycles a lot, mm-hmm. right? So cycles, statistically, not every time, right? And it might not even be most of the time, mm-hmm. but a certain percentage of the time that's not zero, cycles can repeat themselves. The experience that you had with your father that repeats itself, and, and you kind of repeat that. How, how, what would you say to, to either existing fathers, expecting fathers, um, like, or just folks who, you know, may become a father who didn't have the best experience with their own relationship with their father? I, 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 let's back up because I might not have that, didn't back up a little bit because one, I didn't really had a chance to meet my father. My father was murdered when I was 12, Mm. but I had a grandfather Mm. who I said before was my mentor. Mm. My grandfather was, you know, a father to his, his kids. um, And he was a father to me, you know, even till the day he died and he was blind. So, you know, Mm. I saw from there, the foundation. And I had uncles, you know, my Uncle Lent, uh, loving him to death. He's a twin. But my Uncle Lent, you know, always used to come. He was in the military. He always used to come. And he was always took me with him and his kids. So I had him to uh, look up to. I had other cousins who, I have to say, you know, we always say a woman can't raise a man. I think that's a, a big lie because women can. They can find the resources mm. to build around their kids mm. and around their young men and their sons to build a man. Mm. They can find the resources because you got an uncle. Um, I had an uncle on my grandmother's side, Uncle Sonny Boy. His name was Uncle Eugene, and he would come around. Um, A next-door neighbor who him and my grandfather was good friends, and they cut hair together, Mr. Zate. Doom was my father figures after my grandfather passed. They became my father figures. So I had that foundation. Even deacons in the church, you know, we always say, you know, you things happen, but things happen for a reason. Mm. Um, the journey that I went on really made me become that father that I am today. And I always tell in my suggestion to young people and to young guys who are becoming fathers, you know, Find that person that mm. can really help you become that father you want to be for your child. Um, a lot of times, it might not be your biological father. Mm-hmm. It might be your uncle. It might be your boss. Mm. But find someone who you mm. could connect with. Um, and ask him about it. I think that's I, something. Let's have the conversation. Yeah. That if you that if I was asked about it, I feel like if you were asked about it as well, hey, you know, I'm trying to be a great dad. Right. I'm trying to let, like, that's something that if somebody came up to me and wanted to talk about that, I'd be like, first of all, I, you know, I don't have it figured out. And I think no. every single, you know, if you, the, the closer you are to figuring it out, the less sure you are oh, about <laughs> anything, right? It, it, it's get harder. You know, I, I always tell people this. I say the difference between my, my kids are nine years apart, but they look like twins. I said, David Jr., he got it. He's fine. Deja, love her to death, but sometimes she's, I'm like, never again, because she be, a lot of times she does things to make you want to pull your hair, and I don't even have hair no more, she want to pull your hair out, but I love her to death because you have to treat her different, because number one, she's a girl, so the emotions and all that, you have to treat them different, but it's, you, you be like, what? What is it now that she don't get or they don't get? But every day it's a new way of thinking how to become, be that father that you can understand. 
one thing I always say, have that conversation. Always have a conversation. Now, you might not agree on what your child want to do, but have that conversation. Mm -hmm. It's hard, too, because I think some of the some of the dynamics surrounding personality that may yeah. make your daughter or your son more or less difficult or easy to get along with or to advise on things or to mentor and to parent, mm -hmm. you know, some of those things in terms of personality traits can be very, very great traits as adults, right? My daughter is really headstrong. She's mm -hmm. really, she's independent. She knows what she wants. And she wants to get it. She's gonna. She's smart too. She's gonna figure out how to get how what to she get wants. It. And if that's not something that you want as the parent, right? A lot of times it's it's chocolate, it's it's cookies, it's candy, whatever. Like it's it's just in her mind whatever she's trying to get. She's she's crafty and smart and is trying to figure out how to get it. And I think sometimes as a parent, you're you're sitting back, you're like, man, this is tough. Like, how how am I gonna work through this? How do I change this about my child? But at the same time, it, that's something that's going to translate into other things. She's not always going to want cookies. Right. Right. It's going to be she's going to want that degree. She's going to want that job. She's going to want that opportunity. She's going to want that house. She's going to want it, you just want to set your kids up to be empowered and confident and understand that they can there is a path to getting what they want and so you know there's a lot of different parenting styles and there's pros and cons to the ne negotiation parenting style most most and, but, and i always tell people nobody gave you a book right. it's a found you, you got to learn how to lay, lay the foundation nobody gave you a book on how to be a parent nobody gave you a book on how to be a father like you said it's many um courses and things books out there how to do this and how to do that, but nobody never gave you um, the book on how to be Absolutely. the father. Absolutely. And, and it's a learning experience. We're going to learn as we go. Um, you tend to learn from your kids from and from other people's kids. Right. And, right, and, for, and from other parents, right? You know, um, you know mothers and fathers. But I, um, we're, we're getting close to time, but I, I, I want to um, first thank you for, for the insight that you shared today um, and and just give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about 100 Black Men and, and some, some things that you guys are doing and and how folks in, in the community in Philadelphia and, and, you know, surround the country, how they can step up and get involved with what uh, 100 Black Men are doing. Okay. Um, one of the things we have going on, we have a mentoring program we have every first and third Saturday at Vaults, um, Big Pitch High School at 23rd and Master in North Philadelphia. Um, we mentor young men from elementary school all the way up to 12th grade. We um, teach them chess, um, money and banking. Uh, we also, we partnered up with Cheney University to teach them farming inside, growing plants inside this container. Um, we're doing a lot of things. We also have a... Um, a partnership on a national level with HBI, which is Home Builder Institute, which uh, we teaching kids carpentry, electrical, and awesome. also industrial painting. Uh, we have twenty. We had thirty seven kids signed up for it at Vox High School. Twenty two have passed the course. Uh, we add more awesome. to it. We we having three phases. Um, we also having an African American challenge next month, um, which we having. Three high schools going to be competing at the local level and two middle schools competing at the local level. Uh, we also do a um, a golf class, first annual golf class is coming up in April. We we want people to come out and uh, get more information out to you. We want some sponsors to come out. It's for our scholarship fund. We want to give that. kids scholarships to, you know, go on to college. Uh, we are definitely proud for all our young people who come through the mentoring program. And we're getting ready to start our C100 back at Cheney pretty soon, which is the C100 is open up to men and women on the college level, um, all historical and also other campuses. Um, we definitely want to start it back at Cheney because, you know, to all the Cheney alums out there, we understand Cheney was the first 
historical black university. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to shout that out because yep. they are, you know, on paper they are. Um, definitely want, you know, get that uh, rolled out. But, you know, I want to say this, you know, through all the, the down, ups and downs that this chapter have been through, this chapter is still standing strong. And with the new uh, board of directors and the members that are still here for the chapter, Philadelphia is still doing what they need to do in the community. Um, and the partnerships that we are starting to bring in is just even greater than, you know, before. Um, awesome. We, we just, we know, we believe in moving on, you know, from our president, um, Brother Lawrence Price, a very good friend of mine. We've been, uh, we've been in the organization. I think Lawrence was there before I was. I came in after Lawrence um, and uh, VP uh, operations. Um, uh, I had to shout him out, uh, Brother Les Lesure, um, who you met. Yeah. Uh, Les, Les came in. Great yeah, I brought him in uh, along with um, several other brothers. We brought him in uh, maybe a year after I, I was in. So me and Les, I've been in the organization going on four. He's been in the organization going on three years. But uh, the board is growing, and what we have done in the community, you know, we had took it to another level. And I think that's when you come to organizations, especially organizations that is uh, ran by black men, we have to leave the attitudes and the egos to the side and learn how to work together. Are we going to agree on everything? No. <laughs> right. No. But we're trying to get to the common we're goal. We're trying to get to a common goal. We're trying to get to the purpose. And, and that's why I love about this new group of guys who are coming into the 100 and this existing board. We don't agree on everything, not by all means, but we get together and we know what our common goal and our purpose is, is to mentor the young men for a lifetime. And that's what our common goal is. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. David, for being on the show and for sharing this incredible knowledge with our with our listeners. Um, get you back in sometime and look forward to continuing to, to do some, some work with 100 Black Men and the Black Resilience Foundation. Thank you, man. Awesome. All right. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you learned something new and this story made you think, then share ITSP Magazine with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.